family, friends, guests, and residents, the city of Minneapolis welcomes you to this inauguration of Mayor Fry, the members of the city council, and members of the Board of Estimate and Taxation. The ceremony will begin with the processional entrance of our city's elected officials, led by a joint honor guard represented by officers of the Minneapolis Police and Fire Departments. Good morning and welcome to the 2022 City of Minneapolis inauguration. Please stand as you are able and join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Good morning, everybody. Good Once more time. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Thank you very much. Welcome to the inauguration ceremonies today, this very brisk Minnesota morning. Uh, glad to see all of you here. I am Michael A. Gozi. I am the CEO of American Indian Community Development Corporation as my day job. I am a resident of Minneapolis. I'm a member of the Ho-Chunk Nation of Wisconsin, and I'm happy, delighted, and proud to be here. Um, I was thinking this morning about being a little Indian boy. It seems like in my mind's eye a, a minute ago. But in reality, it's been a lifetime. And I've been honored and, and privileged to use the experience of others in making my life what it is today in helping people to uh, understand how together we can make our lives better. I, I've always looked at people um, with the gifts that they have and with the wisdom they brought to me. One of, one of the quotes I, I use is, and this was um, by Martin Luther King, and it said, the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at times of challenge and controversy. And that really is character. And that's the character that we bring to whatever we do, whether it's in our family, in our work, in our life, within our friends, within our relations, within all of the aspects of our life. I was driving in northeast Iowa one time and I came across the hill and there was a big sun in the sky and, and it was a beautiful day. There was a little bitty church on the hill and on the sign in front of the church it said, you don't become a good captain by sailing calm seas. And I looked at that and I thought to myself, ain't that the truth? You know, not that we want to go through life looking for turbulent seas, but we want to be prepared for the time 
when that might be the case. As I reflect on the last uh, number of years, it seems like a, long, a lot longer, of the challenges and controversies that have faced our city, that have faced our mayor, I have seen him stand up to those and, and be part of the conversation, be part of the change that we need to move forward. And that's why I was honored today, honored when I was asked to, to take part in this, to take part of the inauguration of Mayor Jacob Fry and the City Council and the members of the Board of Taxation. At this time, I'd like to introduce, um, not by standing or anything, but just introduce the electeds that we are honoring today in the inauguration. Mayor Jacob Fry, Council Member Ward 1, Elliot Payne, Council Member Ward 2, Robin Wansley Warlebaugh, Michael Rainville, Ward 3, Council Member Ward 4, Letitia Vita, Council Member Ward 5, Jeremiah Ellison, Council Member Ward 6, Jamal Osman. Council Member Ward 7, Lisa Goodman. Council Member Ward 8, Andrea Jenkins. Council Member Ward 9, Jason Chavez. Council Member Ward 10, Aisha Shugtai. Council Member Ward 11, Emily Koski. Council Member Ward 12, Andrew Johnson. Council Member Ward 13, Lene Pelisano, and Board of Taxation and Taxation Member Steve Brandt, Board of Taxation, uh, Estimation and Taxation Member uh, Samantha Pre Stinson. Please, a little round of hands for those people. We are here today, it's the beginning of, uh, of their, um, their work that, that we look to them to fulfill. At this time, it's my honor to um, introduce uh, Bishop Richard D. Howell, Jr. from Shiloh Temple. Let us pray. We thank you, Father, for this moment, for this day, this hour, this week, this term. As we ask you for your invocation, invoke your presence upon us, that Lord, and do it with speed and diligence to guide every mayor in this room, our mayor, our city council, the Board of Taxation, with your blessings, your wisdom, your knowledge, your honor and your glory. Fill this city with your blessings. The work that lies ahead of them, Lord, is a great work, but you assigned them to do it. Their heart is in your hand. And because of your glory, and because of your strength, we thank you to be with them, go with them, and Lord, bless their offices. Bless our city, bless our communities, Bless us all. In your name we pray, amen. At this time, it's my privilege and honor to introduce Mari Fiestelban, the principal at North High. <laughs> I get that on a regular basis. I blame my husband for the confusion of that last name. Um, I was honored. My name is Mari Chantel Melander Friesleben, um, a product of Minneapolis, Minneapolis Public Schools, a parent, a practitioner, um, my heart definitely in the city, very grounded in North Minneapolis. Was just here a few months ago for our high school graduation, so this space has 
warm fuzzies for me. Um, was honored to be invited to help put my stamp on today's ceremony. Um, pictured my words being more for you guys. Um, but they're at my back. So I hope as these words come out of my mouth, um, I hope that you all hear them, but I really hope that you all receive them because they're intended for you. I begin every school day with morning announcements. I find it provides both a practical purpose in reminding us of upcoming events and current landmarks and a cultural one. It reminds us of who we are individually and collectively. So in that spirit, here you go, and all my babies and teachers who are watching online from home today, if you didn't know, we are in e-learning, um, they'll recognize how this next portion sounds. Good morning, Minneapolis. This is Mrs. Free Slaven with your morning announcements. Today is Monday, January 10th, 2022. It's a chilly day here in downtown Minneapolis, but you have braved the elements to show up here today, and it is by no accident that you and I are here together. The last inauguration of our city took place this month four years ago. I believe you all were at City Hall rather than the Convention Center, and hopes were high. Mayor Fry, you spoke directly to the future, being bright and being ours. And though our con country continued to wrestle with the homicidal ideations that have plagued law enforcement for generations, optimism around a new chief in Minneapolis contributed to that spirit of hopefulness. Two years later, 2020 began with sober and tragic reminders of that old plague. With the murders of Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor, the powder keg for me felt near ignition, and I know I was not the only one. And as COVID became more and more of a reality, the definition of reality frayed, and lines became blurred. The morning after that Memorial Day, I awoke to what had become the all too familiar notification, cell phone video, in my inboxes showing that all too familiar scene that would surely end in death accompanied by that all too familiar caption, do not delete. But something was different this time. I recognized that uniform, I recognized that location, and my stomach sunk as my brain registered what my eyes were seeing. And then my body followed suit. By sinking to my knees on the floor of my bedroom in prayer. Within seconds, though, it struck me that there was no need to pray in my room on my knees when I could go pray at this place on my knees, so in my car I went. I parked across the street and stood on the southwest corner for a few minutes as traffic whizzed by. Then I took a deep breath and walked across the street and knelt between the trash receptacle and the bus shelter, crying calling out to God. I remember one man in a white t-shirt standing in the corner store doorway, and he was yelling, triggered. I remember polo shirt and khaki pants wearing men with close cropped haircuts and unfamiliar badges clipped to their belts, bending down and asking me if I could tell them what happened if I was a witness, and me shaking my head no, tearfully telling them that I had just got there that morning. And I remember a man pulling up and screaming, how many more? And I remember a teenager walking by me who was unable to hold in his gasp. Slowly more people began showing up, flowers were being dropped off, and others had joined in the kneeling and the sitting and the pacing and the mourning and the praying and the crying and the calling out to a God that we all hoped hurt us, lamenting. And I remember the buses kept pulling up right up next to the curb, right where we were sitting. No regard for the morning. And the trash collector pulled up, angrily stomping around us to get to the garbage bag out of the bin. And I remember seeing my reflection in his mirrored sunglasses when I looked up, sensing his irritation as if my presence offended him, and then him slamming the metal cover back on so loud that I jumped. And I remember thinking, they need to stop. The buses need to go around. The trash man needs to park 
further away and walk up, someone needs to tell them that this area needs to be off limits right now, blocked off. And I remember the national media had begun showing up. The strongest thought of all struck me in that moment. This is going to be bigger than Rodney King. And it was. And though it was not blocked off then, it was blocked off later and for more than a year to come. Leaving that tragic intersection to become a complex memorial of healthy mourning and unhealthy rage, causing aftershocks of toxicity and contributing to political paralysis. And ultimately, leaving that moment to be a defining one for us all, but especially for the leadership of this city, especially for you all. It is the charge and honor of leaders to swoop in, go first, make the decisions that are right, over popular in that moment and let their legacy of years to come stand firmer than their current cautions around risk or popularity. And you all have that charge and honor right now, right here, today. It is the charge of leadership to both shut down and open up. It is the charge of leadership to proverbially burn out the bad before the people burn down it all and lose the good along the way. And it is the charge of leadership to wake up on a frigid, cold January day and know that you have been made for such a time as this. An old proverb says, we may throw the dice, but God determines how they fall. The leadership dice have been thrown and it's been determined to fall on you. This is no accident. And I am here to remind you of that. And just like I remind the students and staff of North Community High School every day, while I'm simultaneously reminding myself, I now extend that reminder to you today. Please hear it. Please know it. Please feel it. Have a wonderful, wonderful day, a wonderful year, and a wonderful time of office here in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where it is no accident that you are who you are, where you are, and doing what you're doing. Please receive into your spirit what I remind the babies of every morning. You are loved more than you know. You are braver than you can imagine. You are more beautiful beyond what you can see and you are stronger than you sometimes feel. We have a lot of work to do today, so let's get to it. Thank you, Principal Friesleben, for those amazing words. I know they resonated with everyone. And speaking of the charge of leadership, at this time I will administer the oath of office to Mayor Fry. Mayor Fry, would you join me please at the podium? Do you, Jacob Fry, having been elected to the office of mayor of and for the city of Minneapolis, now solemnly swear that you will support the Constitution of the United States of America, the Constitution and the laws of the state of Minnesota, and the charter and ordinances of the city of Minneapolis, and that you will, to the best of your ability, faithfully discharge the duties that have been provided to you as mayor throughout the term to which you have been elected. So help you God. I do. Congratulations. Mayor. Thank you so much. Good morning, Minneapolis. Today is a great day. Four years ago, 
I had the great honor of standing up at the foot of the grand staircase in City Hall, wishing our city a good morning, a buenos dias, a suba buen accent. And I'm humbled and grateful to be standing up here again today as we purposefully chart the next chapter for our city. Despite a change of scenery, we knew this momentous day couldn't be appropriately marked without all of you, which meant we needed more space to be together safely. A huge thank you to the Minneapolis Convention Center for graciously opening your doors to us. And I'll say it again. Today is and can be a great day, both a day of reflection, as Mari pointed out, and a day of celebration as we honor where we've been and send a clear signal of where we are headed. So outside my office, over in City Hall, there's this wall. It's a wall of photos of all of the mayors that have come before me, from Doralis Morrison back in 1869 to one of me four years ago nearly to the day. If you look at that picture, the face looking back is bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, far less weathered than I am now, far fewer crow's feet, a lot of less gray hair. But the more important changes have materialized internally a deepened respect for and awareness of the magnitude of our work, the importance of service. And I've been a student to so many lessons learned over these past four years, and especially the last two. I think we all have. The murder of George Floyd and the global racial reckoning that followed rocked our city to the core and we all have been forever changed. It is on us as leaders to hold in our hearts the weight of this chapter in our history, not burdened, but reminded of our solemn responsibility to be unrelenting in our pursuit of better serving the people of Minneapolis. It is this dedication to service that binds us here today and must be present in every decision, every meeting, and every interaction that we have. This morning, in our very first official appearance together, we stand up to take on this mantle of service, to tightly grasp the opportunity before us and harness our collective talents, our collective passions and convictions to uphold our oath of office. To our returning council members, Lisa Goodman, Lene Palmisano, Andrew Johnson, Andrea Jenkins, Jeremiah Ellison, Jamal Osman. You've earned the trust of your constituents and proved your ability to represent your unique communities. You are bastions of experience, voices of wisdom. These are gifts, gifts that I hope that you share liberally. And to our new council members, council members Elliot Payne, Robin Wansley Warlaba, Michael Rainville, Latricia Vita, Jason Chavez, Aisha Shugtai, and Emily Kosky. I look forward to getting to know you all, not just as elected officials, but as people, as human beings, and then forging new partnerships as fellow public servants. Council members, you are up to the challenge ahead. You were elected because you indeed reflect the values of the communities that you are now charged with serving. And as of your swearing in, the responsibility is yours to not only represent those values, but to put them to work in service to our city, in service as a collective team. Importantly now, the politics of this last year, they are behind us and they are over. The hard work of governing lies ahead. In addition to your role as an individual representative of your individual communities, you are now a member of an extraordinary team that is in fact our city enterprise. That team, importantly, includes 
all of our members, our members of our board of estimate and taxation, and Sam Priest Stinson and Steve Brandt, they will be helping us to be good fiscal stewards as we serve our city. From the team in my office to council members and staff down the hall and all the way up to that water filtration plant past northeast. We are all individual pieces of something greater than ourselves. The sum of our parts is a powerful force that keeps people safe, keeps the water running and keeps the trains moving, sometimes quite literally, for more than 430,000 residents and even more workers and visitors who count on us every single day. And they are counting on all of us because public service, it is a team effort. And if there's anything that you take away from this speech, it is that. People are counting on us to work together. This sentiment is possibly best exemplified in the successes and, yes, shortcomings we've seen in Minneapolis's community safety system. The discussion around the future of public safety has dominated conversations from dinner tables to boardrooms and everywhere in between. Now today, the campaign is behind us. The work of making our public safety system better, more effective, and more inclusive. It is now before us. So my ask is simple to everyone. Pull up a chair. Pull up a chair. We need all levels of government at the table. We need neighbors at the table. And we need to be pulling in the same direction, fully recognizing that our end, de end destination is the same. Every resident in every neighborhood of our city needs to feel safe. This team includes our park board and our community organizations to make sure that children have places to go, a positive outlet where they can just be a kid, a young adult. Do you like playing trombone or mixing new beats? Are you interested in robotics or coding the next big video game? We've listened, we've planned. And now thanks to a once in a generation investment in youth recreation in our parks, this spring, this spring, these critical pieces of youth-inspired infrastructure will become a reality. Kids need space to run with a great idea, run through a new song, or sometimes for a kid who can't sit still, they just need to run. And we create these systems intentionally for young people who are grappling with new and unfamiliar challenges to redirect our kids away from a path of violence, a path that far, far too often ends in tragedy. Tragedy that not only acutely impacts a neighborhood, but our entire city. This tragedy fuels the urgency of citywide solutions. And in developing those solutions, we cannot afford to deal in absolutes. We uplift and support officers that demonstrate values of procedural justice and build community trust, while holding officers accountable that fall short of those ideals. From the Community Safety Work Group, which is working diligently on recommendations for deep-seated reform and results-oriented policies, to a recent meeting I had with Representative Cedric Frazier around empowering the Minnesota Post Board to revoke license for licenses for misconduct, we can build a thorough, more equitable criminal justice system without diminishing accountability and the need to uphold the law. So right now, we are doubling down on our work to expand our own team here in Minneapolis by proactively seeking service-oriented recruits and cadets and making lateral hires with the intent of bringing on four recruit classes by the end of this year. We are building a pipeline of talent through our community service officer program. And thank you to those community-minded officers who take up this call to be the change in our department. But here's the thing, public safety is not a police-only issue and will not be a police-only solution. From funding adolescent work group violence intervention through our Office of Violence Prevention to providing mental health responders to care for those in crisis, we are taking action to create a comprehensive and integrated public safety system. 
We're pulling up chairs for leaders from across the city to bring a sweeping range of perspectives to the table and making sure that their diverse lived experiences are reflected in our public safety and accountability programs. These issues are complex and deeply interconnected. There is no single solution, but we have and must have a singular goal. We need to be better serving all of Minneapolis. The ripple effects of our progress here will be felt across this local government's priorities. That includes the push to fuel truly inclusive economic recovery right here in Minneapolis, right now at this time. Minneapolis is coming back. We will rebound in fine form. Will it be difficult? Yes, it will. But we are up to the challenge because our city does not quit. We will blow by the old normal to recover in a way that uplifts and empowers black and brown communities that have traditionally been left behind and excluded. From investing in BIPOC commercial property ownership to relieving millions of dollars in city-issued licenses and permits for cash-strapped businesses, when we talk about recovery in Minneapolis, we are talking about committing to inclusion as a matter of practice, as a matter of expectation. This pandemic has reinforced what the Minneapolis business community, the economic driver of this region and state, has understood for decades. As Jonathan Weinhagen, our Minneapolis regional uh, chamber head, will tell you, we depend on one another. There exists a symbiotic relationship across businesses and communities that has sharpened our propensity for innovation and propelled our community forward. The ecosystem is being rebuilt. Now it must be rebuilt stronger than ever. For the first time, maybe in history, businesses both new and old are coming back online at the same time, and they're working together. The brewery is hosting events featuring products from a local boutique. The boutique is sending customers to a nearby restaurant. From a budding cultural and commercial hub in Camden Town to the hundreds of employees coming downtown with the introduction of Deluxe's headquarters, Minneapolis is steadily building back as we navigate the many, many chapters of this pandemic as we are doing so today. This room is indicative of those challenges right now. And we know that bolstering economic recovery is not exclusively a business endeavor. Right now, we are weeks away from families beginning to participate in Minneapolis's first guaranteed basic income pilot. The pandemic continues to exacerbate racial economic disparities in Minneapolis, and the families most financially impacted have been front and center in the creation of this program. $500 a month will be in the hands of 200 Minneapolis families this year, with payments rolling out now and in the coming months. With a service-minded approach, we can more directly support the unique needs of the most vulnerable families. Our solutions must be both broad and precise at the same time. As I said in 2018, housing is a right. And it's our job to make sure that that right is extended to everyone. And let's be real, we do, in fact, have our work cut out for us. We must do everything possible to continue forward with this pledge. We need housing solutions that are as dynamic as the communities that we serve. Our partners at Homeward Bound, led by our host today, Mike Gozi, and Avivo Village are building innovative and culturally specific low barrier models for residents experiencing homelessness. They've heard, served hundreds of residents individually, more every single day, and they are models for cities across our state. Sometimes service to someone in need is as simple as a door that you can shut behind you at night, a nightstand on which to put your belongings, a space that makes room for partners and pets. We must demand dignity and shelter for our unhoused neighbors. It is through partners like these that we can amplify our efforts to provide safe shelter and stable and affordable housing. In the last few years, Stable Homes, Stable Schools has prevented or ended homelessness for over 3,000 
150 children in over 1,100 families, and we're only going up from there. Other jurisdictions here in Minnesota and around the country are looking at stable homes, stable schools as a model for improving housing and education stability. I'm really thrilled that uh, I was able to welcome uh, my friend and proponent of this program in Dorothy Lawson as my honored guest here today. Uh, Dorothy, I haven't even gotten a chance to say hello to you yet, but your story is an inspiration to me and so many countless other people from experiencing homelessness earlier in her own life to helping children of families and shelters stay caught up at school and supporting unhoused teens grappling with mental health challenges, Dorothy's propensity for making connections and her deeply, deeply kind heart have been there for so many people during some of their darkest times, have been there for so many of Minneapolis, Minneapolis's families during the toughest moments in life. Simply put, we're able to help more kids through stable homes, stable schools because of your generosity. Please join me in thanking her for her work and give her a huge round of applause. And it gets even better. The National Association of Housing and Redevelopment Officials recently recognized Stable Homes, Stable Schools with an award of merit, citing the program's unique solutions for tackling homelessness and the achievement gap at the same time. I'm immensely proud of our progress so far, and I'm so eager to continue this important work with all of you. In many ways, our service extends well past the 58 square miles within our city limits. We are not on an island. As citizens of this planet, it is our responsibility to think globally and then act locally. Our Green Business Cost Share Program is providing incentives and support for businesses to invest in renewable energy and energy efficiency options. We're investing in that program and focusing on bringing the most innovative green technology to businesses of all sides, sizes in all neighborhoods. We will prioritize and incentivize transitioning away from fossil fuels to meet our ambitious clean energy goals by 2030. When making financial decisions, our analysis won't be limited to dollars and cents today, but will make sure to account for the extraordinarily expensive social cost of carbon tomorrow. So how does this service come together and get to work for the people of Minneapolis? Excellent service requires excellence in clarity and efficiency. Right now, with the passage of a government structure amendment, we have an opportunity to work together to create a government that can achieve both, and if done right, will last for generations. A steadiness of purpose and honesty of implementation is perhaps more important in this endeavor than anything we'll do in our time here. Our form of government transcends any policy or program, any politician or department head. Our integrity of government is the rock upon which all progress is built, and it's up to us to ensure that it is rock solid. The decisions made here won't necessarily grab headlines because these decisions are in the weeds of local government. But it is within these weeds that our seeds for the future are ultimately planted. One thing is for certain. Any individual success is dependent on our ability to work together as a team. We have every reason, every incentive to serve as a united front in the challenges that lie ahead. But to be sure, unity does not mean unanimity. At times, we will disagree. Disagreement and constructive argument are a cornerstone of our democracy, but that cornerstone is kicked loose when we fail to prioritize our commonalities. In this work, we will make mistakes. Some shifts in direction we take today, decisions deemed righteous now will be deemed extraordinary in 25 years. Others will fizzle out or fold under changing times and newer, better ideas. It is our job, it is our obligation to strive for the extraordinary, work like hell to get there. 
And where we fall short, and we will occasionally, we fall short as a team. Because when we rise, we rise as an entire city. I'm really grateful to the residents of the city of Minneapolis for the opportunity to serve uh, another term. And I know that council members uh, and the Board of Estimate and Taxation are so grateful to those residents as well. And on a personal level, I know that this opportunity would not have presented itself if not for the tireless love and strength of my wife, Sarah. Through the most challenging days over the past four years, Sarah has been a constant support, a reliable recalibration, especially when I needed it most. You've given me the greatest gift of my career, the greatest support I've ever had, but also, and importantly, the greatest gift of my entire life and our daughter, Frida. Thank you to my mom and dad who have traveled here to help us celebrate this important day and it means the world to me that you're here. Thank you supporting me for supporting me for who I am and always showing up no matter what. Partners and families experience these highs and lows of service as directly as the public servants, sometimes even more so. So to our council members, your families won't sign your oath of office, but they probably should. It's our families, defined by love, that pick us up and put us back together each night. Their names, they're not on the certificates, but they're here today. And to those families, please accept my personal thanks for your service. Please, everyone, join me in giving them a huge round of applause. For the extraordinary leadership of our department heads who have walked alongside us as we navigated one of the most challenging chapters of our city's history, thank you. Thank you. As we chart a path forward with a few new faces in the mix, I am endlessly grateful for your unique talents and your dedication, constant dedication to this city. And last but certainly not least, to city staff. Many of them working tirelessly right now, today, and every single day for their Herculean efforts to keep our city running day and night. You have overcome barriers that just a couple of years ago would have seemed incomprehensible. You have stepped up. You have fearlessly scaled barriers that have existed at times for generations, and you keep on working, striving for better. Every day your work exemplifies the noble profession of public service your work is essential, and we must trust your expertise accordingly. Please join me in giving a huge round of applause for our extraordinary city staff. Our city is a ship. Many have served for 25 years, others who have served for 25 days, others who have served for 25 hours but they do this job because they care so deeply about our city. It is all of us working together, all of us. Our contributions fuel the engine that ultimately pushes us forward, steered by the purpose and convictions we have all committed to right here on this stage. Our commitment to service is why we are here today and what binds us together as we approach the challenges of tomorrow as a team. The honorable work of good governance requires long-term focus with an immediate urgency of now. As public servants, we must do both. The people counting on us to get this right are not afraid to demand the highest levels of service, and we shouldn't be either. So it is my hope that our most lasting legacies outlive our tenure as public servants. That if generations from now our names are forgotten, the mark we leave remains because right now we are the ones in the arena. We strive valiantly, sometimes coming short again and again, yet we remain committed to our worthy cause because the stakes are that high, the moment is now. Today is a great day. Thank you.
Thank you, Mayor Fry. This morning, uh, the mayor and the members of the city council and the members of our board of estimate and taxation will be taking and subscribing their oaths of office. And as we call the council members down uh, to the front of the stage in order to take their oath, I'd like to just say a few words about the importance of the oath. The oath is more than a formality. It represents all that is necessary for the foundation of a government of laws. A government is uh, one that is of, by, and for the people it claims to serve. The oath is a solemn vow that binds these officials to the people of the city. And today, as they embark on a new elective term, we require our leaders to make this pledge to us that they will uphold the law and that in doing so, they will themselves observe and obey the law that both empowers them to act in our behalf and that requires they act at all times in good faith and in accordance with the limits of the power that we, the people, have invested in them. So at this time, I'll invite all council members to raise your right hand. Do each of you, having been elected to represent the various wards of this city, now solemnly swear that you will support the Constitution of the United States of America, the Constitution and laws of the state of Minnesota, the charter and ordinances of the city of Minneapolis, and that you will, to the best of your abilities, discharge the duties that have been provided for you as members of the city council throughout the terms to which you have been elected. So help you God. I do. Congratulations to all of you. And now I would like to invite Mr. Brandt and Ms. Priestenson forward to take their oaths. I'll ask each of you to take one of the microphones on either side of me. And we'll administer the oath to the members of our Board of Estimate and Taxation. Please raise your right hand. Do each of you, having been elected from the entire city to serve as members of the Board of Estimate and Taxation, now solemnly swear that you will support the Constitution of the United States of America, the Constitution and laws of the state of Minnesota, and the charter and ordinances of the city of Minneapolis, and that you will, to the best of your abilities, discharge the duties that have been provided to each of you throughout the terms to which you have been elected, so help you God. I do. I do. Congratulations to both of you. Hello again. Having been an athlete for a lot of my life, I realize that you lose more than you win. And it's the losing that creates the experiences that you need to win again. You know, I always say, tell people, they said, you golf? I said, yeah, I, I'm a golfer. Um, how are you any good? I said, well, the last shot I took, I put the putt in the hole. <laughs> and so I left on top, is what I always say. But what we learn from our losses and our learn from our challenges is how to do it better, how to make a difference, how to tweak it. And sometimes it's such a tweak. You know, a, a baseball player that bats 300, that means he... he doesn't get hit seven times. And the difference between a batter 
at 300 and one at 325 is a tweak. It's just the way you hold the bat. It's where you put your shoulder. And so it's the little things in our lives, the little things that we can do to make ourselves better. And that in turn will make our communities, our families, our communities, and our city better. January 20th, 1961 was a big day for me. It was my birthday. Yeah, and so I'm very fortunate. I, um, I share the birthday with, with a number of folks, um, but it's, it's a big day because it's, it's Inauguration Day. January of 1961, there was a young president by the name of John F. Kennedy. And he spoke that day, and, and he, one of the things he said that resonated with me was, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. And I take that to heart. You know, it's up to me to make a difference in my life. It's up to all of us to make a difference in our lives, in our lives of our city, in our state, in our country. I ask today that as, the, as residents of Minneapolis, of residents of Minnesota, that we ask not what our city can do for us, but we ask what we can do for our city. Our city needs our help. You know, I, I, I met uh, Council Member Chavez the other day, and, and I said, well, I'm Mike Gozi. And he said, I know you because I see you everywhere. That was an honor. I choose to show up. I choose to be part. I, my feeling is if I'm not part of the solution, I am part of the problem. And so I look at how I can be better every day, not just for me, but for my family, for my friends, and for the community that I serve and the community that we all belong to. And so today, I ask, as we leave this auditorium, that we look within ourselves, we look to ourselves to create the best Minneapolis we can create. And we look to our leaders to support that endeavor. It's my honor to introduce Rabbi Marcia Zimmerman for the benediction from the temple. Temple Israel. All things pray, and all people pour forth their souls. The heavens pray, the earth prays. Every creature and every living thing prays. In all life, there is a longing, a longing for something better with our hopes and dreams. It is a kind of prayer to the Almighty when we roll up our sleeves and do the work that is needed to see that we are part of a larger whole, not just an individual taking care of our needs, but seeing the ripple effect to every human being, to the stars and the moon, to the earth and the heavens. We pray in the flashes of human mind and the storms of the human heart. I love it. We are not captains in the calm seas. It is said that an amateur built the ark and it was professionals that built the Titanic. <laughs> we are amateurs as each of us are human beings, no matter our role, our title, our responsibility. We need to build an ark, an ark that will take us through these complicated waters. We are not here to stamp our feet and say, no, I will not help. We are here to pray, to pray 
with our feet and our hands and our hearts to lift up the homeless in Minneapolis, to feed the hungry in this city we love, to roll up our sleeves to work for racial justice, to open our hearts to public safety for all communities. A moral vision it is, a moral vision we create together. These are our prayers the wordless outpouring of boundless longing for a better world as we turn and remember those who have come before us, their successes and their failures, and we learn from them as we create a better present and future for all. Together, as our creator, bound us as a diverse family, may we lock arms to walk together, to walk on the streets and the halls and every single place that we call a sanctuary today and tomorrow. It is for all of us the sacred miracle of every life. Baruch Ata Adonai, Ha'el HaKadosh. Blessed are you, the holy prayer that surrounds each of us. Amen. That concludes these inaugural proceedings for the 2022-2023 term of the mayor, council, and Board of Estimate and Taxation.